Welcome to Real Life Podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Martin. This podcast is dedicated to teaching, encouraging, proclaiming the good news of life, abundant life. Today, we have the topic, we're going to be talking about the topic of salvation. You might say, uh, I know about salvation. I know what that's all about. But I want to really encourage you to really take time uh, to review what is salvation and what does that mean to me? Uh, What does it mean to me as a Christian? What does that mean to the world in itself? I think we overlook that word because we think we understand what it means. And, you know, there's so much that we need to go back at times uh, because there's so much in some of these words that we use so flippantly. And salvation is one of those that I think sometimes we take for granted that we understand it. And also on my podcast, Daily Devotion, I have just recently uh, started the book of Exodus and you're more than welcome to go and check out that podcast as well. And, and the book of Exodus is really a good picture, a physical picture of the the idea of salvation and that's really god is doing in the people of israel he's causing them to be brought out of bondage into new life and then eventually taken into a promised land and so we're going to be talking about that today and i'm so thankful uh, that you've decided to join me and i'd love to hear your responses i'd love to hear any questions you can send those to me at cynthia at dlmm.org So what I'm asking you today is, are you saved? Do you know what that means? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you ever asked him to forgive you and to be the Lord of your life? We say, well, yeah, I did that a long time ago. Does your life show it is what I want to know today. See, the Old Testament gives us a picture of salvation. It's in the story of Passover. Passover is the remembrance of slavery and deliverance from captivity. It is the celebration of the Israelites leaving Egypt. Passover is the celebration of God's love and his power in delivering his people out of the hand of the enemy. It's a time in uh, the in Judaism that is set apart by God. They actually celebrate Passover still. If you're Jewish, I bless you. If you are not Jewish, I think it's real important that we look at our spiritual roots because whether you understand it or not, Christianity does come from Judaism. So Passover itself is a time of year. It is a celebration. It's been set apart by God for them to celebrate the setting free. And I think there, it's important that we as Christians take time to celebrate our Passover, our salvation. It's important that we take time to look at it and to really ask God to show us what it means. And what, what areas in my life can I be um, sounds strange, but more saved. What areas of my life can I be set free? Uh, Areas of my life that maybe I haven't let go of. Areas of my life that I need maybe some deliverance in some form. Maybe I need to be able to allow you to love me in an area that I've had closed off to, to the Lord. So Passover was a time that was set apart by God. It was set apart for specific spiritual transactions to take place. It was set apart to praise God for his work of deliverance in the past. It was set apart to seek him for a fresh release of deliverance for today and to gain faith for his work in the future. You know, you might say, well, I don't need any deliverance. I'm fine. I'm already saved. This is kind of a boring topic. Uh, I encourage you to listen and think about this as, as we move on. See, because we as Christians have a deliverance to celebrate. We were also in bondage and oppression to Satan. When we received Jesus as our Savior, we were delivered from bondage to Satan. Unfortunately, many of us are still living like we are in bondage. And that is not what God's intention is. In the Old Testament book of Exodus, we find the story of Passover. Passover very simply means that the Israelites were passed over. Passed over what? You might ask. See, God had heard the cry of the Israelites while they had been in Egypt for 400 plus years, almost 430 years. And God had passed uh, that that those years had passed and, and God's judgment was going to be poured out. However, he made a way of escape for his people. It's called Passover. 
they did not have to follow or they did excuse me they had they had to follow the instructions um, which included killing a, a lamb each family and draining the blood and placing the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their home and God accepted the de death of that lamb in the place of Israel's firstborn now most people think okay so did are, are you aware that they had to bring this lamb into their home and keep it for four days wouldn't that be difficult to look at this thing for this little animal for four days a perfect lamb God said if it, they're to eat all of it, they weren't to leave leftovers, you know, that really talks to me about how God provides for us every day. And we're going to keep going on here. So here's what happened. By the blood of the lamb, Israel was redeemed. The judgment of God was turned away from them and God, the gods of Egypt were judged and their power broken. If you think about all of the curses that the, the, the things that happened when Moses was dealing with Pharaoh to get the people is really what is what's happening is God is showing us that he has power over every uh, idol, every demon, every force that the enemy has tried to set up to keep the people thinking that he's the one who brings them their provision. But God is the one who does that. So God broke the power of all the gods of Egypt. And Israel was released from oppression and bondage, and they were set free to enter into God's promise. You see, in the New Testament, in the book of 1 Corinthians, verse 5, uh, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Jesus is our Passover lamb. And through the Passover, we learn who Jesus is and all that he did for us when he died. He came as the lamb of God. His blood redeem us, redeems us. His death and judgment has turned away the power of the enemy, and the enemy's power was broken. We were released from bondage and oppression, and we were set free to enter into God's promises. Now, if you are saved, if you carry the, the label or the you say, I'm saved, I, I have salvation, then are you free? Have you been released from bondage? Has death and judgment been turned away from your life? And are you free? to enter into God's promises. And are you entering into God's promises? See, salvation is simple. We, diff we make it difficult when we try to explain it. God offers us life and freedom and his promises. And it's up to us to decide if we want his gift or not. It's really that simple. If you're not sure you're saved, or if you know you're not saved, scripture gives us instructions on what we should do. The... Word of God in Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because all of us are sinners and we must admit our need for a Savior. All have sinned and we must recognize our need. Also, after we recognize that we have a need, we have to believe that Jesus is our salvation. When Jesus came to earth, it was a miracle. He gave up his position in heaven and came to pay for our sins. He gave his life for us. He was the payment for our sins. In John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And we must receive his gift. We thank him for, we thank him for loving us, and we ask him to live in and through our lives. Then we have the promise that's found in John 1, 12. It says, But as many as received him, to him he gave the right to become the children of God. Then the Bible tells us that we're to confess our sin and then confess him as our Lord. Our sins create a wall that separate us from God. And as we recognize that we've sinned, we need to, and that we've fallen short and that we're sinners, we have to admit our need. We say, oh God, I see. I see. I need to repent. I see. And then I believe in you. I believe that you are the Christ. You are the one who can set me free. Lord, forgive me for my sins, because our sins create that wall that that separates us from God. And by confessing our sins and turning from them, you'll find forgiveness. In Romans 10, 9, Scripture assures us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And in 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Have you been purified from all unrighteousness? Sometimes we get the forgive our sins part, but we forget the purify us from all unrighteousness. You've been born again, and now you're a part of God's family. 
So then we tell someone what Jesus has done in our life and we get ourselves connected to a teaching and believing group. And I encourage you to find a group of believers that believe in the word of God, that are filled with the Holy Spirit and who are people who disciple. See, because we need to recognize that we're a sinner and we need his forgiveness. We must believe that he is our savior and receive him as such in our life. We must confess our sin and pray and tell him that, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. And then we tell others and we ask another Christian to help us in our new life. So if you've not prayed for salvation, if you've not asked the Lord into your life, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you what you need to do. You just need to ask him. You, you, you recognize, as I've just said, that I'm a sinner. I realize I have sinned. And so we just come before the Lord and we say, thank you, Lord, that you have loved me and died for me. Thank you that you shed your blood to pay for the penalty for my sin. Lord, I see that I'm a sinner. And as an act of my will, I turn for my sin. So repentance is, I turn from my sin and from all my efforts to save myself. I turn to you and receive your forgiveness. Send your spirit to live in me and make me a new person. Make me the person you created me to be. By faith, I thank you that you have heard my prayer and that have saved me. Thank you, Jesus, and that you are my savior and deliverer. Amen. So, you know, that's really all there is to it. Okay. So God says that's all we need to do is recognize him. Just say, God, I see. I see you. I see me. I need to turn from who I am and turn towards you. I need to turn away from the life that I've led and turn and make a repentance change in my life and follow after you. You know, I found this confession of faith or this uh, declaration that I found that has been really helpful and you may do it on a daily basis. If you declare, uh, if you declare it every day, I can see it, it helps. It really does. And if you desire to do so, uh, send me an email. I'll be happy to email it over to you. I'm redeemed by the blood of the lamb out of the hand of the enemy. Thank you, Lord, that every old cycle and bondage is broken. Every chain and claim the enemy had on me has been paid. I am free. I am blessed. I am favored. I am healed. I am whole. I have all God's promises available to me. And as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I love that because that's getting up every day and declaring, this is who I am. I am a child of the King. I have been redeemed and that every cycle of bondage has been broken. And that we can move into God's promises. See, a very important aspect of being saved is learning and growing in our new life. And how is this accomplished? By establishing a regular disciplined devotional life. And you're like, "Ah, I don't know how to do that. I don't, I don't, uh, this is just so overwhelming. It's so boring. See, this devotional life consists of reading and studying the word and praying and becoming a part of uh, a group of believers that will help you grow. So, you know, I understand that when I began reading the Bible, it didn't make any sense to me. But I promise you, as you continue, one day a light bulb's going to pop on and you're going to say, wow, I know what that means. It's just like exercising, which is horrible, I know. But as we start out, we're like, this is, a, this is not doing anything. But if we continue, we see changes in our physical body and we build up strength. Same thing happens when we read the Word of God. We find a version that we can most relate to. We begin to read it. We begin to ask as we begin to read, God, show me what this means. And he will. And if there's so many Bible studies, there's so many things out there, out there today that you can use. Back when I uh, was getting my life straightened out there, I lived in a very rural area. There wasn't the internet that gives you an idea how old I am. There wasn't, there was the internet, but it wasn't used like it is today. Um, But there weren't, books and things that are so easily I don't remember even Amazon being around it might have been and I just didn't know about it because I wasn't so very computer literate at the time but you know I lived in this very small town there was no bookstores there was no information I lived um, far far away I don't even know where the nearest Bible or Christian bookstore was I didn't know there was one I didn't know how to get it the only thing that I saw was TV evangelist and and that wasn't anything that I was looking for And, you know, so there's so much that's available today. 
Sometimes that's uh, not as good of a thing as it is a bad thing because I was forced to read God's word because there wasn't anything else that it was available to me that I could find. But, you know, there is there is no excuse today because there are podcasts that will lead you. You know, I, there's I'll do a little uh, commercial for my other podcast, Daily Devotion. It's a one, reading one chapter of the Bible, making some comments on it, and then I pray over you in 15 minutes or less. Come on now. There's nobody that can't find 15 minutes, and it's usually less than 15 minutes. Well, it's, well there's only two times I can see that um, I went over the 15 minutes, but it's usually around 10 to 12 minutes long. There's no reason why you can't get into the Word of God one chapter a day. There, one verse a day, you know, if, that, if that's too much for you, if that's just too overwhelming, then one verse a day. Get a copy of your pastor's sermon if you're attending church and listen to the thing all week long over and over again until it starts to get down in your spirit, until you can start to grow. See, so very that it's very important that you learn to, that you begin to learn and grow in your new life, and how and that's accomplished by having that devotional life. So many are concerned with what things look like some worry about what they or their partner look like or dress like and others worry about having the right house or the right car or where to vacation and the list goes on and on but none of these things are really bad in themselves however things cannot be the focus of our lives we need to be more concerned with our inward appearances inward appearances you know God's word says it's a mirror when we look into it it shows us who we are and James 1 23 says a person who reads the Bible and doesn't apply it is like someone who looks in the mirror and then forgets what they saw. Only when a person repeatedly looks into a mirror and makes an effort to remember the image will they know what they look like and what needs to be changed because God's word reflects in our hearts who we are and what needs to be changed. It's one of the tools God uses to draw us to himself to look more like him. Likewise, only when we read the scripture all the time will we know what our hearts look like before the living God. The Bible acts as a mirror to us and it reveals who God is and who we are. We need to go to his mirror and let him show us what our hearts look like daily. When his word shows us what we look like and calls to our mind the sin that we've not confessed, and attitudes that must be adjusted or priorities that need to be, need to be realigned, realigned. We can then let him do the needed makeover. But if we don't look into our spiritual mirror, we can become trapped in what we look like on the outside only. We want to be more than what we look like on the outside. The Bible does a great job of exposing to us what we cannot see. It's a deep cleaning in areas that we can't reach and fixing us in areas that we can't even begin to repair. Let me encourage you to read the Bible regularly. When I began it, it just didn't make sense to me. So I would pray and ask the Lord to help me understand and learn his ways. And as I stated before, I just continued to read every day. And all of a sudden, I understood what I was reading and I could see how it applied to my life. The best instruction you can be given is to just start. If you have to force yourself. Now, I like to tell people, uh, it's a trick I used, and it's really a trick I used when I began to learn to pray. I started using an egg timer. <laughs> yeah, really, an egg timer. I would set it uh, for a certain amount of time, one minute, three minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes, until I got to a place that I was praying a certain amount of time a day. How much I pray or how much I prayed it isn't re relevant. But what is relevant is my prayer life brew. And I did the same thing with my Bible reading. I read a certain amount. I made myself give have a certain amount that I would force myself to read every day. I don't even remember what it was. I think it was one chapter. That always comes back to me, one chapter. And I read one chapter. And the next day I would read one chapter. And then I would find myself on certain days reading many more chapters because it was really interesting. I was in, in a story. And I began to start changing because I started soaking myself in the word of God. And if we are truly a saved Christian, you know, where we truly have had the experience of salvation, we should look more like God every day. 
we should look more like Jesus every day because salvation is to bring us out of this worldly system and to put us into the kingdom of God. And when we're put into the kingdom of God, our purpose is to be about his business. Our purpose is to be more like Christ, to represent him on the earth today, to represent him, to represent him to the earth and to people. You know, we can go back clear to the, the garden in Genesis where God created the universes and he created everything and he made man and woman. And he looked down and he said that they were good and he gave them work to do uh, to, to care for his garden. And he gave them dominion over the creation. You know, that's our original purpose. And when we're saved, we come back into that purpose. But now we have an extra duty. Not only do we have the duty to watch over his creation, but we have the duty to represent Jesus, to give people what we've received, to become more like him every day. People should be able to look at your life and know that you're a Christian without hearing a word that you say. Is there enough evidence to show others, for others to see and know that you're different, that you are a Christian? That's what salvation is. We become holy people because he is holy. What does holiness mean? Well, in Genesis, we says that God created the heavens and the earth and, and uh, man. And on the seventh day, he rested and he set it apart and he called it holy. He himself is set apart because he's holy. He's holy. He's set apart. He's different than the rest of us. He doesn't look like us. He doesn't sound like us. He doesn't, we're in his image, but he's, he's separate from us. Not because he wants to be distant. We think of separation as distant, but it's really difference. He's different than we are. He's holy. And on, on the Sabbath day that he set apart, the seventh day, he set it apart and said it's holy because it's set apart and it's different. Are you set apart from the people on the earth today? Are you different? Are you holy? Don't get into holiness as a list of do's and don'ts. Yes, the do's and don'ts do come out of who we are, but not because someone puts it on us. It's because of it comes out of who we are because we want to be more like Jesus. Not because someone says don't wear lipstick. That's not holiness when someone gives you a list. Holiness is when we are separate from the world because we choose to be more like Jesus. We want to be like him. And we've come into a deeper relationship with him. And we're growing and becoming more like him. What's so awesome about Jesus is when he left, he gave us the power to do everything that he did. Excuse me, I have to get a drink here. And not only did he give us the power to do what he did, he instructed us, go forth and do everything that he commanded us to do. To do what he did, to say what he said, to reach out the hand of mercy and power like he did. To set people free from the things that they're in bondage to and to make disciples. That's our call. And we can only do that as we become like him. We can't do that in ourselves. So I want to ask you today, are you saved like that? Is that your experience of salvation? Is that what salvation is to you? Being like Jesus, being brought from death to life. That's what salvation is, being taken out of bondage. You have areas in your life that you still need salvation. You have bondages that you need to be set free from. Whether that be, we always think of the big ones, you know, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, um, lying, all those kinds of things. But what about attitudes, right? What about prejudices? What about laziness? What about gluttony? Those are things that we don't like to talk about. Those are more acceptable, right? And that's a sarcastic comment. So I, I just want to leave you with that today. Are you saved? Are you truly saved? Do you have that relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have that relationship with God that you can say, I am his child? I am looking. I, I am looking. I look more like him today than I did yesterday. Thank you, Lord. Am I whole? Am I saved everywhere? Do I have 
freedom in myself that I can just go after Jesus, that I don't have a fear of man. I'm not controlling. I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't have any shame in me. I, I know who I am and I know who he is and I know who my enemy is. Can you say that I am free to extend the hand of healing to those around us? Are we healing the sick, folks? Are people being raised from the dead in our presence? Is our shadow healing the sick? That's why I say, I always say I have work to be done yet because my shadow is not healing the sick. You know, Jesus said that the works that I do, you can do, but you can even do more. Well, folks, we have a long way to go. That's truly, truly, truly what salvation is, is when we look like Jesus. And that's my opinion. And I'd love to hear yours. God bless you and thank you for listening to real life.